run over real quick, uh, but before we do, I want to call your attention to right back here in front of this stand, I put a map up of the reservation. And the reason I put that up is to show everybody what the, in terms of ownership of land on the reservation today, how much land the tribe, individual Indians, and then white folks actually own within the reservation. So if you get a chance to look at this map, we're going to take a little break about halfway through. We're going to try to end about 8 or 8.15. The yellow on this map represents non-Indian fee land, land owned by white people. The white on the map is individual Indian land that each of us might own or own an ownership interest in. And then the green part is tribally owned land. So if you look at that map, the tribe only owns probably less than 20% of the land on the reservation as a tribe. Us as individual Indian people together, we own maybe 40 to 45%. And then white folks, that yellow, they own maybe 35 to 40% of the reservation. And that, that goes to that issue we talk about jurisdiction and sovereignty that goes to what we have really control over. So I wanted to bring that in for the folks that were here last week. We talked about that a bit, and I wanted to put that up so that everybody would have a chance to see it. And as I said, we'll be taking a break about halfway through, and you can come up and take a closer look. Before we... Okay, well, we're maybe by way of a little review, a couple of preliminary things first for those of you that didn't come last week, and just to remind ourselves what we're about, that we're here talking about constitutional reform. And when we talk about that, we want to be real clear up front that we're not talking about changing enrollment. We're just talking about how we change our government to make a better government. Second, we kind of agreed last week that we would follow a simple kind of approach that it's better to educate everybody first before we start trying to write a document or write what we think the changes will be. So what we're trying to do is just start by educating ourselves and each other so that when we're done, everybody here will be able to go out and have their own sessions and educate other people in the communities. And we actually had more folks here last night, and I, I want to recognize that we lost a member from the South Side, the husband of uh, one of our council members, Mr. Calf, Pat Calf Bossribs. So on his behalf and in his honor, I'm going to stop for just a moment, and we'll just have a short moment of silence in memory and honor of Pat and his family. And uh, with that, I recognize that the funeral was today. We might have lost some people due to that. There were many folks out there last night for the rosaries. And I didn't make it out, but I'm sure there were many there this afternoon. And so 
We're going to do this every Wednesday night starting at 6 o'clock. Got probably more than enough food tonight, so after tonight maybe we'll call around each other and decide who's going to bring anything so we don't end up with too much. But the next time you come, well, let's try to bring something else, another warm body to help educate people. And so that's what we're, we'll start with that. Now, actually tonight we're going to start just a little bit differently. I want to thank Virgil Edwards for putting this together and his son donated this projector to us to be able to use and Virgil put together a PowerPoint. Now before we go back to last week's PowerPoint, this week he put on the original 1935 Constitution. And I thought it would be interesting to look at that real quick. We're not going to go through it thoroughly. But just in comparison to some of the things we talked about last week, and for those of you who are our computer people and understand all of that, that lingo, I'm going to turn this off for just a second so we can show that. Our current, you can barely see those numbers up there. The 1935 Constitution is 31 kilobytes long. The current Constitution is uh, 300 or 105 kilobytes. So we've almost tripled the, the length of our Constitution in that time, in uh, 75 years or so that we've, that we've had it. It's gotten much longer. We've added to it. As we talked last time, most of the additions we've made to it have had to do with elections. Now, right here, he's got something that's real interesting because it's, a, to me, a demonstration of how much the other people, the people before us, how much attention they paid compared to how much attention we, as a group of people, pay today, us modern Blackfeet. So right here in this little box, it has, back then, there were 1,785 eligible voters. 1,785 people were eligible to vote on the Constitution. And of that amount, 994 voted in the election. So more than half of the tribal membership at that time voted in that election. And as we'll see when we get back to our own document, um, in our changes over the years, we've had a lot less than that. I think today, in, in a current uh, modern tribal election, we have in the last election about 3,200 voted in the tribal council election, and about in the primary, and about 3,100 voted in the general election. And today, I think there's about 8,000 eligible voters. So just barely over a third of us even vote today and participate. So. Real quickly, we'll go through that. The, the first article hasn't changed at all. And we talked about that last week, about how that's defined, that the jurisdiction of the tribe shall extend to the territory within the confines of the reservation boundaries as defined by the agreement of 1895. If we look at the agreement of 1895, that's the agreement that we had on the Cedar Strip, Glacier Park and the Badger to Medicine. And I went over that today with one of the young lawyers when we put this map up. If we look at that agreement, the only boundary that that agreement defines is the western boundary. So if some smart lawyer from out there wanted to challenge us and ever got to looking at all of this stuff, they could go into court and say, gee, the Blackfeet in their own constitution didn't even reserve jurisdiction over their whole reservation. They just reserved it over their western boundary. You know, that place up there on the park line, it's about this wide. So they could make an argument that that's all we have jurisdiction over. So that's just one of the many reasons we need to move forward with change. Article 2 on, on membership, we talked last week that we've amended that twice. And the first, that way back when, in the first one, it said, all persons of Indian blood whose names appear on the official census of the role of the tribe on January 31st, 
January 1st, 1935, and any children born to any blood member of the tribe maintaining illegal residence within the reservation. So as we know, we've amended that to include the blood quantum requirement. The next interesting one, going back to the original Constitution. Now today, as I said last week, anybody that runs for council knows that you gotta win Browning. You better campaign hard in Browning. And if you win Browning, even if you're from Hart Butte or you're running from Seville or old agency, chances are you're gonna get on the council. And the reason for that is that we have today what we call at-large voting, meaning that we in Browning, we get to vote for the Hart Butte representative, we get to vote for the old agency representative, and we get to vote for the Seville representative. And that's why the people in Browning, the greater Browning area, really control the outcome of any election. We got away from rep what we call representative government. We're like, we're gonna have an election here in the state next week. And we got Indian people running to represent our district in the state. Only people in this district, it stretches all the way down to Flathead, but only people in this district get to vote for those representatives. So I think for the Senate, we have uh, Leanne Johnson and Letha Whitford, or Leah Whitford. But only the people in that Senate district get to vote for them. All the people in Montana don't get to vote for them. And then we have a representative race. And the same is true there. Only the people in this district for representative get to vote. Everybody doesn't get to vote. But way back when we first adopted this Constitution, two things. It says the council shall consist of 13 members. So way when we started this, we had 13 council people. And in fact, as we talked last week, we, uh, the, the old people used to refer to the council as 13, as the 13. They didn't call them the tribal council, they called it the 13. And more importantly, it identifies the districts, old agency, Seville, Hart Butte, and Browning. Actually, they called it, you know, if you notice that, they don't even call it the Browning district, they call it what? The agency district. Etun Yupi, that was where, where our father lived. That was the agency here in Browning. And so, then it goes on to say the voters of Old Agency shall elect three councilmen. The voters of Hart Butte shall elect three councilmen. The voters of Seville shall elect three councilmen. And the voters of the Agency District shall elect four councilmen. So in other words, we had true representative government back there. The people from Hart Butte picked their own representatives. The people from Old Agency picked their own representatives. People from Seville picked their own representatives. And the people from Browning, they picked their representatives. And again, as we'll see going forward here in a minute, today Browning picks, we all vote for everybody. Hart Butte votes for Browning, Browning votes for Hart Butte, and so on. The next section is just on, on Article 3 is elections. And we're going to talk about our own constitution here in a few minutes. But as we can see, there's only one, two, three, seven sections. Looks like it might be no more than a page long. As we talked last week of the 11 amendment, amendments we've made to our constitution, the majority have been on elections and nominations. And so that today, our election rules are about four pages long. We've more than tripled that. We've made more amendments about election than any other thing that we deal with. We've, so we've been more concerned about election than we have been about the power of the council and how our government actually functions. So the next section is Article 5, Vacancies and Removal, something we had a big fight over these past few years. So if we look there, that's only two sections long, just uh, three sentences. If a council member shall die or resign, etc., 
The council shall elect to fill the unexpired term. And a council member may be uh, expelled by nine members or more. So remember we had 13. So nine members or more voting for expulsion. Uh, before that vote is taken, a person shall be given an answer, opportunity to answer the charges against them. Council's decision shall be final. Now notice what we're going to see here in a few minutes. There's no criteria. There's a thing that we're going to see today about uh, bringing, uh, uh, the, engaging in conduct that reflects on the dignity of the tribe or being drunk or missing meetings. None of that's included in this original document.